Just remember on the time is worth. Okay, we're about to get started. <laughs> Um, we have Roger and Anil talking about virtual environments. Hi, I'm Roger and I like to talk and manage Linux systems. This is Anil, he likes to race cars and beat the shit out of my systems. As the slide says, we're here to talk about performance testing in virtual environments and some of the ways it varies from performance testing on bare metal. We've broken this talk into three parts. First, we want to, remember, want to remind you why, abuses like benchmarking aside, stress and performance testing is actually a good idea. Second, we're going to discuss some of the general principles of performance testing that are applicable to every environment, including the virtualized ones. And then finally, in the third, we'll get on to some of the lessons we've learned about stress and performance testing specifically to virtual environments. Stress and performance testing has a bit of a bad name. It's easy to be cynical about it because of the amount of benchmarking and axe grinding that it's misused to support. There are cheats everywhere. That's because pride and money are often at stake. At best, this involves companies using well-designed test suites like the TPC benchmarks in novel and less than entirely truthful ways. And at worst, well, how many times have you seen people arguing that you should adopt their new web framework because it gives a 1% benefit on serving hello world and static files? Three in the last year is my answer to that. If there's anything more depressing than the cheats, it's the people who are not even smart enough to know what they're doing is wrong. But done properly, stress and performance testing does add value. Performance testing, uh, when all pretense and artifice is put aside, is the qualification of the total decisions. Both of them going? You got me? Yeah, yeah about now. There yeah, we go, get closer. So, pretense will start. Is performance testing, when all pretense and artifice is put aside, is the qualification of the total decisions in getting a software and hardware stack into a production environment. This is from the hardware design to the software architecture to the workarounds put in place by developers. All of this taken from the point of view of the end user. This is the critical thing. It's how it works for your end users in the environment. To achieve this in a non-production environment, we need to look at resource intensive as well as high utilization and high risk transactions. They need to be combined to provide a representation of a production workload. But to be honest, if we're going to create a full test coverage suite, it's not worth it. The return on investment over time in terms of maintenance and just the sheer complexity means that it's not worth doing. Today, we're not going to go into detail around particular tools. Look, there's just too many of them. They all vary, but the central tenets are the same. What you're going to do is what you're going to do. The important thing to remember is that in order to complete a successful test cycle, repeatable results need to be obtained. As such, we need to fulfil the requirement to isolate the stress workload from other environments. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing your tail for days, chasing your tail for days on end, only to find that a database was being restored, or that another guest was being built for another project. It's critical then to say that the man management of change in such a malleable environment is the most important thing that you can do. So, stress and performance testing is, or ought to be, a science. Most of the people in, the, in this room, I expect, have at least a high school understanding of, of science, perhaps even university level. Your performance testing should be like a lab, an environment where empirical thinking drives the process. You state your goals, you explain how your tests are going to meet your goals, you document your outcomes, and you document your changes, making them one at a time. You need to understand what you're measuring. People get hung up on numbers like utilisation and steel and whatnot. But what your users and customers care about is the user experience metrics. Did their analytic batch job come back in minutes, hours or days? Did their interactive app respond in tenths of seconds or tens of seconds? Once you know whether you're hitting your goals, then the system metrics become interesting. Above all, 
production is your control environment. We've had a running argument with a colleague for months because he keeps on insisting that when he sees an unexpectedly bad behaviour in production but can't reproduce it in our lab, then production is wrong. No. The lab is wrong because we are modelling the real world. If we start asserting that the real world is wrong because it doesn't match our models, we're not doing science anymore. We're doing economics. <laughs> Thank Roger for the punchline. So let's have a look at some of the types of tests that can be completed using performance test artefacts. In the world where I work, our tests are developed from use cases or stories, or they're built to drive a specific part of the stack, say for example a web service operation. But the central design tenet is that any of these tests can be used together to emulate production. One of the key things that we do is proof of concept. Get in early. Disprove or prove whatever has been bought from a nice glossy brochure. Getting in early has the ability to save money, both in wasted effort and disproving the figures offered by our previously mentioned charlatans. You can do peak load simulation. What's your application going to look like on a Monday morning when everyone logs in at once full of vim and vigour? Or perhaps the last payday before Christmas, or the distribution of online exam results? We also run stress tests. We need to know when it's going to break. Everything's got a break point. And are you able to confirm the threshold of your environment? We also run duration and soak tests. It proves if you've got a memory leak. You've got the app up and running, is it going to break over days, weeks, months, or even at all? And perhaps the most important is customised tests for specific uses. We've answered all the normal questions, but in your new high availability app, how's it going to fail over under a full production workload? We can use our previously created assets to be able to work with sysadmins, with DBAs, to be able to ensure that your environment's going to work. But the question remains, does virtualization change everything? Good news, the good news first, all the benefits of virtualization apply to your stress environments. So being able to provision quickly and so on and so forth. If you've done, spent any time doing this sort of work on bare metal, you'll know that one of the biggest pain points is making significant changes and running projects built on common components and infrastructure in parallel. Being able to keep multiple VMs lying around, cloning for fast deployment, rollbacks all save significant time and money compared to stress on bare metal. So this is one of those areas where it does what it says on the packet. The biggest problem in understanding and debugging performance issues in virtualised environments is really simple and it's not technical at all. It's people. The person who looks for the thing that's different to their encustomed environment and blames that. There's no shortage of people out there who have heard that virtualization causes problems or who fired up the first generation of VMware once 10 years ago and it didn't work very well for them. Therefore, this must be the problem, just like there's people who ran a Java app back in 1998 and continue to insist that garbage collection cripples performance, or argue that you can't build large applications in PHP while they're logged into Facebook. And then there's people who just look for any excuse not to do their job when they can blame something else. Some proportion of people in your organisation who are used to dealing with bare metal will reflexively blame the virtualised environment for everything. Oh, if only we were running on the server, we wouldn't have these problems. There are uh, a number of answers to this. I prefer uh, this one. But my managers are strangely reluctant to endorse actually hitting people until they talk sense. One answer they will accept is training. Train your people. One way we eliminated a huge amount of pain for ourselves was when we went around teams in our bank and spent some time and energy doing seminars and training sessions on the differences between our virtual and bare metal environments. And this is a theme we'll be coming back to when we get into more detail around what we've picked up. Another was to get more people involved in the stress test sessions. There's a temptation in stress testing to get your A team involved every time. And that knowledge then doesn't sort of spread out within the organisation. And you need that knowledge socialised. 
it was really interesting to see how many people didn't know this, understand it, particularly developers, and it was interesting coming to grips with the gaps and even basic troubleshooting knowledge around the place. Overall, it's been worthwhile. It's resulted in a huge reduction of the, in the number of stupid and pointless conversations in my life. <laughs> the, uh, the next most fundamental difference is the obvious one. You've added another moving part to your stack. Since the whole purpose of stress and performance testing is optimising the moving parts, that means you need to understand the hypervisor and that means you need to instrument it. Trying to diagnose performance questions and understand how your application is going to scale without proper metrics out of the hypervisor is stabbing around in the dark. Are you seeing poor I.O. because the guest has, is running out of resource? Because the hypervisor has run out of CPU to emulate the virtual I.O.? Or have you actually fully utilised the physical resources, the NICs, the disk, what have you? We've seen all three problems at various times, and before we were properly instrumented in the hypervisor, we usually confused the cases one with the other and spent a lot more time trying to diagnose them than we needed. One of the nice things, of course, about Linux-based hypervisors like KVM is that we can use our normal Linux tools on the hypervisor itself, something I really like. It minimises the amount of new knowledge required. Our ZVM environments, for instance, are really successful for us, but on the other hand, we had to bring in a whole new range of expertise and terminology and get to grips with that. Now, so far we've been talking in fairly general terms, and now I'd like to go into some more real-world examples. The first goes back to the comments about training, the thundering herd of admins and developers. A large proportion of the people I work with have been in the habit of trying to understand systems by logging into them and running their favourite tools en masse, leaving dozens of copies of top lying around. As, uh, as one of the uh, Z experts who's repurposed himself to Linux likes to say, the reason they call it top is because it's the top of the CPU chart when you look at it. <laughs> now, that's not actually too bad on bare metal systems where you've often got heaps of spare grunt, heaps of overhead, but when they do it on a dozen VMs with half a dozen people on each VM, all running their special snowflake tools at once, it makes a bad situation a lot worse. People need to look at centrally gathered information and they need to learn to do that. They should be doing that anyway, but now they're actually crippling the systems in the process of doing it the wrong way. Another one that we've found people has a hard, have a hard time getting to grips with, reporting skew. When running Linux as a VM, the 2.4 series of kernels were notorious for reporting errors of CPU time and similar stats, often by orders of magnitude on the same platforms. And that flowed through to all the tools you were using. If you use Oracle's stats reporting tools, they would pick up exactly the same errors. You'd get complete nonsense out of them. The 2.6 line of kernels gave us some really big improvements in that space, but even today, in our environments, we routinely see the kernels of virtualized Linux environments misreporting numbers by up to 5 to 10 percent out of whack with what the hypervisor tells us. For a single VM, not a big thing when you're running <coughs> dozens or in our case hundreds of systems on the same piece of hardware, that adds up. People need to be educated to understand that they need to look at the hypervisor instrumentation first and the guest second and to accept that the hypervisor is authoritative. If your instrumentation is smart enough to correlate the two automatically for you, so much the better. On ZVM we use a tool called Velocity Isamon that actually pulls the Linux stats out via SNMP and applies a correction based on what it sees in ZVM land. And that's a great example of doing it the right way. These are actually pretty minor education and tooling issues compared to our biggest bugbear, Steel. Steel has been a huge pain in the ass for us. Why is that? I have a picture of a person who thought up the title for this value. Steel is a term that causes disharmony amongst ponies. You stole my cycles. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'd be pissed off at people too if I thought that, if I thought some other bugger was nicking all of my available resource. But unfortunately it sends people off in the wrong direction. They start looking for the cycle thieves often before they even actually have a problem, or worse yet, instead of understanding the problem they actually do have. Because if you're seeing steal, it may be because your hypervisor is overcommitted, or it may be because it's simply doing a lot of work on your behalf, or it may be simply because you're seeing everything running right. Steal time probably seemed like as good a name as any when someone thought it up, but the problem is it's actually highly misleading. It represents a whole bucket of things. Yes, it can represent the time taken to run other VMs instead of yours. But that's kind of the point of virtualization. You want to get as close to 100% of your utilization on your iron as you possibly can. If you aren't using those idle cycles, I'll put them to good use elsewhere and you'll never know the difference. More amusingly is that steal time can also represent the time the hypervisor spends working on behalf of the guest. The IBM team at Berblingen, who work on the Linux on mainframe kernels, tell the amusing story of a customer who logged a support call because they could still see a percent or so of steal time, and this was unacceptable. They wanted to know how to eliminate this troublesome amount. Mainframe cycles are expensive, right? The Germans were forced to explain that the only way to do so would be to stop the hypervisor from performing any disk, network or console I.O. on behalf of the guests, which would be a little limiting. <laughs> but people get hung up on the figure. They will explain with absolute certainty that they need more vCPU because they can see steal time. They may have a whole vCPU of idle time showing as well, but they don't see that. They just see the steal. The final word on steal is user experience. If your stress tests show you're hitting all your goals, the steal value is meaningless. A final technical word about maxing out your hardware, you need to understand how hard you can push your environment before it falls over. And this is something we hit heavily in our stress tests. We run a variety of hypervisors, ZVM, some KVM based ones and VMware. We find they all degrade at different points and with different characteristics, depending on the hypervisor and depending on the workload running on it. ZVM is our utilization champ. Runs at about 85 to 90 percent all day long, depending on the workload. Some people get it as high as 95 percent utilization before they see problems. Our experience with VMware, on the other hand, is that once you start pushing 70% utilization on the box, you're in trouble. KVM's been about 80%, which isn't too shabby, but it's no ZVM. On the other hand, given how much ZVM costs, it should be the best of the lot. At these points, performance starts to degrade massively. We typically see huge drop-offs in virtual disk and virtual network performance as the hypervisor runs out of headroom to emulate those resources. In the early days, not understanding that and not having the hypervisors properly instrumented caused us a huge amount of pain. We saw plummeting I.O. and failed to understand it was a CPU problem. So off we went to the SAN, the core switches, you name it. The hypervisor itself had become CPU bound. That was the problem. And once we did have things properly instrumented and were in the habit of checking that instrumentation before we ran off on wild goose chases, we saved a lot of time in our stress environments. In the worst case, an earlier version of our KVM based hypervisor on the other hand, would reboot when 30 or 40 guests fired off a bunch of I.O. and CPU intensive, guess, intensive jobs at the same time. Yet on the other hand, we could run them at 80% CPU all day long, as long as they weren't doing much I.O. So you get some very variable and potentially some very toxic behaviour. Well, Roger's covered a lot of the scenarios in terms of a technical perspective. But finally, a practical it's a practical issue. Look, you can spend an infinite amount of time optimising. If you're working on something for your own interest, that's cool. If you aren't, you need to be aware of how your costs and benefits stack up. But in a heavily virtualised shop, the equation can be quite different. Think about a 5% performance improvement on a standalone, standalone server. 
that might be meaningless to your end users if the server is barely utilised. But when that 5% reduction in CPU is a tuning that can be made to one, two, 300 or more VMs, you can be talking about some serious savings. So, today we've looked at some of the basic tenets of performance testing. It's interaction with both physical and virtualized environments, and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. But we've really only scratched the surface of the possibilities and the learnings. So before we open the floor to questions, we would like to take this opportunity to say that we are more than happy to discuss in greater detail any of the things that we've touched on today. But for now, the floor is open to questions. You may need to run down with the mic. <laughs> Workload. Any particular workloads that are toxic to VMs that aren't that you've encountered that might not make economic sense? Um, um, databases. It really kind of depends. For example, we find in our in our Z environments, um, IBM's JVM really doesn't let us overcommit on memory and CPU as much as we'd like. So WebSphere workloads don't virtualize there as well as we like. Um, Compiled binaries like our Oracle workloads, on the other hand, run like absolute champs. We fully utilise our LPARs all day long with them with absolutely no problems at all. Uh, on the other hand, the same WebSphere loads on the Red Hat virtualization environment run like a cut cat, but we've found there where we mix I.O. intensive and CPU intensive in the current production versions of the hypervisors, we get really bad behaviour. So it really is a throw it against the wall and see to a certain extent. Um, but our experience is definitely our IO intensive workloads run like a champ on the mainframe, which you'd kind of expect. Um, and more CPU intensive, we find chucking that on cheap Intel hardware works well. The other complication we've got is because we work with a lot of proprietary software, we spend a lot of time looking at licensing models as well as pure performance and evaluating what's going to work best where. Now every vendor's got their own flavour of virtualisation, they're often really keen to make it financially advantageous to buy their virtualisation stack as well as their application, application layer. What's your um, favourite tool of choice for collecting and displaying your metrics? Um, probably the best one we've used from a virtualization point of view, and this is a fairly limited use, is uh, Velocity's ESIMOM. The reason for that is it pulls in the standard Linux stats um, via SNMP. It pulls in the ZVM hypervisor stats. It gives us a really rich view on the hypervisor, but it also does that automatic correlation. So all that kind of skew we see inside the guests it corrects for, and it also tells us how much it's correcting. Um, so all in all, that's the best one we work with typically. But as I say, that's kind of a narrow applicability. So what do you use for the um, KVM-based monitoring? Uh, we're kind of cursed with uh, BMC's portal tools. Um, in reality, we end up using SAR directly on the hypervisor. Any more? Is it ever better to just stick with the underperforming VM rather than going for the bother of transitioning between different uh, virtual machine environments? Sorry, could you repeat Sorry. that? I didn't quite catch I'll it. just phrase it a bit better. Uh, when do you find, uh, for what sort of performance gain would you transition uh, virtual images between different software? Um, for what sort of performance gain would you think that's worthwhile? As you said, for example, KVM, VMware software, finding a 10% performance difference. At what point is it worthwhile migrating everything over for different workloads? Uh, for, for us, it basically boils down to cost. So if we look at something like our, uh, our mainframe class hardware, uh, 
The CPU cost there and the memory cost is relatively expensive. For things that virtualize well on it uh, and don't blow out, blow out the CPU utilization, like our Oracle databases, um, it's really good to keep them there. For low CPU applications, um, the availability of the platform makes it really good. For our higher CPU applications, like say our internet banking stack though, um, it's just not, it, it's not feasible to run it on the, the proprietary iron. So it's, the, the break point is probably going to be quite specific to different environments. And as I say, for us it's driven by money rather than, uh, rather than any kind of abstract technical concern. Which I realise is kind of a generic answer, but that's how we've ended up slicing and dicing them. Given the experience you've had across a variety of hypervisors underlying virtualization technologies, I'm sure you've got quite a wish list there in terms of what would make your life easier. You know, looking at the work you've gone through over this time, what would you say to those vendors to say, if you can just do this to give us these stats, it will make our life easier, it will make this analysis much simpler? You know, could you give us a few highlights? What would be on your wish list? The uh, the number one I've asked, number one one I've put up to IBM in the past when talking to their uh, to their mainframe hackers is having the kernel better able to talk to the hypervisor, because although we can use monitoring tools to talk to the hypervisor, talk to guests, and correct those, obviously WebSphere's performance counters, Oracle's performance counters. Whatever products run inside the guests don't necessarily benefit from that. So if kernels running as guests and VMs were better able to communicate with the hypervisor and self-correct the stats they're reporting at a kernel level, that would cascade through to everything else in the guest, giving more accurate results that it feeds out to the rest of the world. That would be my single biggest, uh, single biggest wish list item. And within the, uh, some of the performance testing you've done, do you typically leave the hypervisor free reign over how it's allocating resources, or do you do things like explicit CPU pinning, dedicated memory allocation for your stress test VMs, you know, what kind of steps you take to make sure that you're getting a, a reproducible data set? Depends on the platform, but by and large, so on our big iron um, where we can use LPARs to get hardware level segregation, we make use of that, right? It's not a perfect abstraction, but it's good enough. Um, in terms of our, our lower end kits, our Intel boxes, they're cheap and cheerful enough that we provision dedicated stress environments, or we co locate stress and DR so that we are you know, max maximising maximizing the hardware we get for the money. Um, I would not try stress testing co-located with other significant workloads unless you've got hardware level partitioning, otherwise you'll just spend the rest of your life chasing erratic results. Any more? Excellent. Thanks very much for your time.